Hi everyone, I'm Hussein Elage. I'm a young gynecologist oncologist from France and I'm a previous fellow of the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer and today I have the pleasure to interview uh, Dr. Mary McCormack and uh, to talk about the Enterless Trial. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for inviting me, it's a pleasure. Uh, with all the recent data and trials uh, going on in cervical cancer, uh, we've been waiting for the results of the interlace for the last uh, years and now we have them. So I have a few questions. I'll start with the first one. Could you please provide us with the background and rationale behind this trial? Well, as we know, uh, patients with locally advanced disease, uh, the, the outcome is very variable. And we know that up to 30% of those patients will relapse and die from metastatic disease. Um, of course, we've made progress with radiation and particularly with brachytherapy. Um, and we've been able to dose escalate. But despite all of that, and despite excellent local pelvic control, uh, we still find that a significant number of, bear in mind, young women with this disease will die from metastatic disease. And so there's clearly an unmet need, uh, and that led us to think 10 years ago about how to, uh, what type of trial to design and how to approach this problem. Okay, and could you please describe the study's design and how patients were stratified? So uh, it was a randomized control trial with uh, randomizing patients one-to-one -one between the induction chemotherapy with weekly carbo and um, paclitaxel for six weeks, followed by chemoradiation, compared with chemoradiation alone. The key differences here in this study compared with ones that were done previously, where um, the chemotherapy didn't, the in, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, they called it, didn't actually include a taxane on the whole, um, and uh, there was, they did not control for the interval between chemotherapy and the start of radiation. And we thought that this uh, really needed to be looked at in more detail. So that was the part of the background behind uh, what we were looking at induction chemotherapy. And then we did the phase two study to actually see whether this approach was feasible. And going back to your question about stratification, we stratified according to the, uh, the risk factors like nodal status, um, uh, 3D, uh, nodal status tumor size, um, and, and then we also included uh, 3D uh, compared with uh, conf 3D conformal compared with the IMRT VMAT, because we knew that some patients would be treated in that way. Uh, we looked at uh, tumor size stage um, and nodal status. And it was FIGO 2008 staging, so at that time uh, we didn't take consideration of uh, nodal status. Okay, thank you very much. And could you please uh, summarize the findings of this trial with a, uh, and then discuss the significance of the nodal status? So the findings, we, uh, our dual primary endpoints were progression-free and overall survival. And with a median follow-up of 64 months, uh, we were able to demonstrate a 9% improvement in the progression-free survival rate and an 8% improvement in overall survival. And the overall survival rate uh, was 72% in the standard of care chemoradiation arm and 80% with induction chemotherapy. And this is the first time that a randomized controlled trial has published, uh, a, 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 has published survival figures of the order of 80%. At least it's the first that I'm aware of, uh, where we've seen that level of survival in a randomized controlled trial. And uh, the standard of care arm, uh, we know that um, the Outback trial, the five-year uh, survival, uh, was uh, very similar to what we saw in um, interlace. And remember, Outback was a negative trial where they looked at chemotherapy after chemoradiation. Yeah, uh, that's true. And this is impressive. The, the numbers are really impressive. And it's it. I think a lot of people will change their practice. About 44% of the patients in both arms of the trial were node positive. And we've just presented today the PFS analysis according to subgroup. And uh, 
all subgroups, node positive and node negative, benefited from uh, induction chemotherapy. We also uh, presented an analysis by FIGO 2018 staging, so we could separate out the patients with 2B node negative disease uh, and the patients who were node positive to for all old 2B node positive, which would have been 3C patients with 3C disease according to 2018. And they also benefited from induction chemotherapy and there was no evidence of any um, uh, differential effect between the subgroups. So the effect is global so on the effect all is on all patients. All, all patients in the trial benefited, benefited from, from, their... from induction chemotherapy. And I would like to ask you about the influence of the histological type on the, on the results. Well, over 80% of the, 82%, I think, of the patients had squamous histology. About 20% uh, were uh, adeno and adenosquamous. And I think we would expect to see in our routine practice about three quarters of the patients are usually squay, uh, squay, have squamous histology. Um, so I think it sort of reflected um, that the population that we tend to see predominantly, of course, we were recruited from the UK. So I think it reflects that population very well. Yeah. And how do you perceive the, the role of brachytherapy? Well, we know for a very long time that brachytherapy is key uh, to, the, uh, to, a to, to, to cure in cervical cancer. Um, and uh, we're very well aware of data uh, that's been published in the past where uh, the survival benefit in, uh, for brachytherapy alone is of the order of 12%. So it's an essential part of uh, the treatment. We talked about the results, but how do you think this will influence our clinical daily clinical practice? Well, I think it's hard to ignore 80% um, five-year survival rate in a clinical trial with, um, you know, the in my view, has been well conducted and with um, decent follow-up. So uh, I know many colleagues in different parts of the world are very keen uh, to implement this. And of course, because these drugs are widely available and cheap, uh, then the only barrier really is uh, the clinician to the adoption of uh, this uh, treatment. And, and in some places, there may be a cost factor, but it's nothing compared with other sort of more expensive newer drugs. And uh, I would like just to emphasize on one more thing that you you talked about during the presentation. It's the, the, the duration between the end of chemotherapy and the start of uh, chemo radiation. This is absolutely essential. And um, I think uh, by eliminating that gap, so we had our median interval from completing chemo uh, to starting the chemo radiation was seven days. Uh, and the vast majority of the patients had started their radiation within 14 days. And I know from analyzing other trials that this uh, variable was not controlled. And I think um, it's possible that uh, any benefits that were would be observed with induction or neoadjuvant chemotherapy would be offset by tumor repopulation if you allow that interval uh, to go beyond uh, that sort of seven day frame, seven day window. Yeah, we need to keep that in mind. And the last question, last but not least. So we recently also had the result of the Keynote A18 trial. And uh, what are your thoughts on the results of this trial in the in the light of the, the results of the Keynote A18 and how do you see this to be applied in the future with the results of both trials? Well, I, I think obviously key, the, the results are uh, encouraging and uh, on the face of it, it shows an improvement in uh, median progression-free survival, but there are a number of factors that have not really been um, addressed in my opinion. There, I think there are a number of things to be considered uh, when we think about the A18 trial. For a start, um, at the time of analysis, I think about 50% of the patients were still on treatment. So it's very, very early data. And I would have liked to, uh, to see an uh, analysis of progression-free survival at a later time point. Um, so that's one thing. I think the second thing is there are lots of questions to be addressed about the radiation. 
we've seen from the results that about 10% of patients in both arms receive doses of radiation less than 70 gray, which we would consider palliative. And I'm puzzled as to why that was permitted in the first instance in a trial uh, conducted in the last couple of years. Secondly, overall treatment time is a key metric when we come to assessing benefit and outcome from radiation. And for a third of the patients, uh, in, a, in a third of the patients in that study, uh, the treatment time extended beyond 56 days. So this really should have been uh, better controlled. And we know that if you extend the overall treatment time, you really need to significantly increase the radiation dose to compensate for the uh, negative impact on control. I don't think that was done in this study, but we will wait to see the published uh, results and the published paper so that can be analyzed further. Um, I also think that um, we have to look at the fact that when you look at the survival curves, uh, a significant number of patients didn't seem to derive any benefit from uh, treatment in the control arm because they relapsed, they relapsed very quickly or probably just progressed. Um, and I would have expected uh, that uh, even with good, you know, optimal standard of care chemo radiation, uh, perhaps uh, a better outcome in the control arm at 18 months. The other key, of course, the other key point is that uh, with interlace, the drugs are readily available and cheap. And so this can be adopted and implemented everywhere. Uh, with the Keynote A18, and pembrolizumab, this is an expensive drug, and uh, the, the, the treatment is for two years. So, um, you know, this will need to careful consideration uh, when physicians come to discuss this with their patients, because they will need to remain on treatment for a long time and at a significant cost. Thank you very much for your answers, for your time, and for your insights on all of this. And once again, I want to congratulate you on the results of this trial and on the effort you put to make it happen after 10 years. So congratulations thank and thank you very much. Thank you very much.